After finishing with the fourth best record in the Big 12 Conference in 2007, Texas entered the 2008 campaign outside of the Associated Press preseason top 10 for the first time in nine years. Going into the 2008 season, I don't think outside of our building there was a lot of uh, hope or expectations from, from our team. We had to essentially prove a lot of people wrong around the nation. Expectations were pretty low. We had a tons of players leave via graduation, via the draft. We had a lot of essentially no-name guys on our roster that had a lot to prove. It was our year to prove that you know we weren't just a, a chip off the 2005 team. I think 2008, we all had big expectations for ourselves coming into the season. We felt like we were the best team in the country, and we we knew that you know the preseason rankings we weren't where we wanted to be, and we felt like we were underdogs, and you know we weren't getting the respect that we deserved. Head coach Matt Brown decided to switch things up on the coaching staff bringing in a new defensive coordinator who would surely deliver the boom. We didn't play really good defense in the 07 season. We brought in Will Muschamp, who was one of the bright young stars as defensive coordinator, and we brought him in from Auburn. Carol and I flew to Austin, Texas, and, and met with Coach Brown and the staff, and Greg Davis actually coached at Georgia when I was a player. Matt McCorder was a coach at Georgia while I was a player. So I, I knew a lot of the guys on the staff and I felt like it was going to be a really good opportunity to continue to further my career and we were excited about being long ones. When they hired him, we all looked at, you know, YouTube videos. They called him Coach Boone. Coach Muschamp, he's crazy. He was crazy. <laughs> I remember in spring ball, I made a pretty good catch and it wasn't a couple plays later, Shipley made one. And Muschamp, I mean, he pulled a defense aside and said, Y'all gonna sit here and let these two make catches on y'all all day long? I would love to see our budget that year because um, you know clipboards had to be about times 15 that year because he broke them on a daily. The white chalkboard, man. He used to throw himself on that board. Uh, his his hair wailing all over the place. Got control. Everybody, just do your job. You understand that? We felt bad for that board each and every time we played. From slamming his fist against the, uh, the chalkboard to headbutting the clipboard during the game where he was bleeding. In our opening game, uh, I got uh, hit on the sideline through our headsets, and I got cut on the head. The players were looking at me like, this guy's lost his mind. I think there were like t-shirts made of the blood running down his face and just how intense he was. I guess he figured if, if we were gonna be out there bleeding on the game field, he had to be bleeding with us, so he always kind of found a way. The blood, i never seen a coach, I mean, it's almost like a pro wrestler. These guys was bleeding so crazy. I've had a couple issues on the sideline. Brian Rakipo threw me down one time and we played Texas a and my first year at Texas. A little back injury there. I learned not to do that with Rack anymore. I think that kind of helped change the culture at that time because we were in a position where we were somewhat complacent. I think Muschamp kind of gave us some life. He gave us a new, a new energy, some new juice that we needed and down the line it really helped us a lot because Muschamp brought excellence out of each and every one of us. Texas got off to a hot start. The Longhorns ran through Florida Atlantic, UTEP, Rice, Arkansas, in Colorado to reach 5-0. Through the first five games of the season, Texas only trailed a total of seven minutes. 5-0, it's hard to do what you've done. This is really a special group of young people and coaches, and we got a chance to be real good. So throughout all the selfishness, throughout anything other than becoming 6-0, becoming 6-0. From the start of that season until mid-season, when we're getting ready to play Oklahoma, I thought we had improved as much as any team that we'd had since our first year. I think the feel, you know, coming in after starting 5-0, and I think we knew we were good, uh, but it was kind of the point in the season where we had to show on a national scale that we were good, and we'd, we'd faced some pretty good competition, but the run coming up was, was what was going to kind of define us in that season. Every phase, it was just guys were so dialed in that year. We won those few games. We still weren't getting the love. It was all about OU, and you know how we feel about that perspective. So we were building to get better and better and better because we knew what it was going to take 
to beat on you. And so every game we use it to get better and better and better so that when we met in Dallas, it was going to go down. They just asked me about OU. I said, this is the way Texas and OU is supposed to be. Two top five football teams in Dallas getting ready to get after each other. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. Coming up on 2008, the season. This was one of the best games I'd ever been involved with between two super teams that just kept battling and going back and forth with momentum. Big hole, Shipley, end zone ahead, folks. The hype around all of our games was just astounding. It was intense, man. The whole stadium was dressed in black. Just had a whole bad feeling about it. Deep strike. I just can't believe it. We're getting closer to the opportunity to go to the national championship, and all of a sudden, you know, where are we going to be? The debate that's going to be ongoing is going to be between Oklahoma and Texas. Texas was the flavor of the week in the middle of the season. Didn't they beat Oklahoma? Didn't the last time these two heavyweights got in the ring, they boom, they knocked Oklahoma out. You're out, out of there. Going into the OU game is always fun because it is your rival game. It's a border rivalry between two states that don't like each other very much. You already hate the other team. You're getting flipped off as you drive in. You're getting stuff thrown at you. You're getting all kind of insults. This was even more. It wasn't just for the conference race. Oklahoma was number one and we were number five. So this was one of those games that showcased the Texas OU game like it should be showcased each year. This is about as much intensity as you can find before noon anywhere. 11 o'clock, Oklahoma and Texas. One of the most meaningful collisions ever, and it's been meaningful for a long, long time. It's not just about the conference championship on the line. It's BCS implications and national championship implications. The winner of this game has a great shot to stay right in the mix and get to Miami eventually. Going into the Oklahoma game, I think the thing for us was, hey, we, we know these guys like the back of our hand. I mean, we practice for them all year. They practice for us all year. Let's go handle our business. You circle that game every year on the calendar, and we were ready. A lot of doubters thought that our number five was a fluke. We haven't really faced any competition yet. It's still, it's still that doubt. Texas is, is a pretender. And then you got OU, which is essentially NFL ready. It looked like we had no chance in hell. I said, David, he went yeah. to Texas Law School. Right. I love I would live in Austin. I would if I didn't, But forget about it. I'm going with that Oklahoma team. And let me tell you why. They got as good a football team as you're going to find. Wait, give me that props. rifle. Wow. message to the team pregame was uh, you're playing number one, so the best way to, to become number one is beat number one. We may be the best team in the country. We don't know. We may be. we got a great test. All we want you to do, all we want you to do is what you've done every day. Every day. That's all we need. We need your best, and we need tomorrow on film for you to sit there and say, I whip my guy, let's go with your yeah. <laughs> Early in the game, we get down fast. Bradford, though, pumps left. Now comes back. Touchdown, Oklahoma. Moving the pocket right and left. We'll see Juggle caught in the end zone on a ricochet. Touchdown, Broyles caught it. It is 14-3. Up-tempo. Wow. Oklahoma's running the up-tempo offense with Bradford and I remember Will Muschamp had all the defensive calls on his wrist and he was looking at them, they were snapping the ball and we weren't even lined up. So Will and I said, okay, scrap the game plan. That was probably as good an offensive football team as that, the, that I've ever as a defensive coordinator or head coach have faced. Down 14 to three, we all looking at each other like some we gotta do something about it or it's gonna be a blowout. I remember when they went up 14 to three, it was kind of one of those feelings like, all right, if, if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna do it, we better, we better make something happen. I remember walking out on the field. I just remember knowing that something was gonna happen. Turn from the five-yard line is Shipley. Big hole, Shipley. End zone ahead, folks. Touchdown, Longhorns. Jordan came out with that return. I mean, our sideline erupted, our fans erupted, and it kind of just gave us life. 
That flipped the momentum of that game completely. It was one of the best plays in Texas football history. I think you look back on Jordan's career, anytime you needed something big to happen, you know, number eight was, was there to, to make it happen. As far as any play I ever made at the University of Texas, that play is still the one that I get asked about. It's probably the, the single most important play of my career. At that point, I knew it was going to be just an absolute dogfight battle, and that's what it was. Set a screen. Johnson cuts to the end zone. Touchdown, OU. Got a man open. Touchdown, Texas. Shipley again. Another answer. Bradford on the roll. Caught by Johnson for a touchdown. Johnson right straight ahead for the touchdown. As Texas regains the lead. Oh, gravy. I think I've seen everything here today. Johnson to the end zone. Touchdown. Texas and Colt McCoy, 45-35. This game to me compares to the Michigan Rose Bowl game and the Texas USC National Championship Rose Bowl game because this was one of the best games I'd ever been involved with between two super teams that just kept battling and going back and forth with momentum. I think the mindset after the, the Texas OU game is that we've got a chance now uh, to win another national championship. That's when people realize this team is something special. We were on the map at that point. Now the doubters were believers. I mean, it's as simple as that. They, they thought now we were the real deal. Now the nation took notice. Today was about heart. Today was about family. Today was about the team that yeah. bought the yeah. best together. Yeah. That's a hell of a football team yeah. over there. Right. That's a hell of a football team over there. But you fought. You didn't give up. Right. You kept your head up. You kept coming back and kept fighting back. And you knew you weren't going to lose. Yeah. And that's hard to do now. That is hard to do. These two teams are probably two of the best five teams in the country, if not the two best teams in the country right now. We haven't seen Missouri yet, but that's two great football teams out there, and it was a great football game. Whoever bought a damn ticket today, they got their money. We put ourselves in a prime position. Yes, Keep your eyes on the prize. Yes, now what this does makes Missouri bigger. Very quickly, you try to handle the emotion of that win and enjoy it, but start talking about the next week with Missouri. So what we did is we had a funeral ceremony that we set up like you would have a normal funeral, and we buried the Oklahoma ball in front of the team to make sure that they knew that that one was dead and gone, and we had to start looking forward to Missouri. We knew that we really couldn't blink. At any point, we were going to play a really good team. We have another game day game coming back home. You got used to seeing, you know, all the all the analysts and, and those guys in the building. One thing we had to quit doing is watching ESPN because the hype around all of our games was just astounding. Off a towering victory last week in Dallas, the eyes of Texas are filled with stars, envisioning another magical season, the sequel to 05. This is amazing. With all the history that Texas has had, this is the first time since 1977, going back to the Earl Campbell days, wow. that Texas has been the number one ranked team in the country hosting in Austin. What is that? What the hell is this? What is that? That's a cheap one. Yeah. Get rid of that. Yeah, give me the real one. Oh, there we go. <laughs> We were like rock stars at home, honestly. In our first game, being number one in the nation against Missouri, at home, prime time game. I never seen that stadium that loud. Texas is on fire, and the place, the house was rocking. We had some great atmospheres at, at DKR, especially at night, but I'm not sure we ever had one that was any better than that night. The first play of the game, you know, Macklin gets a reverse. The crowd is just going nuts, you know, as it is. And he's coming back around on this reverse 10 yards in the backfield, and I hit him for a 10-yard loss. And they run a reverse, and what a stop by number 99. 
Roy Miller. In that moment, I remember that feeling like this is Texas football. We jumped all over Missouri early. Play fake. McCoy's going to go for the end zone. Touchdown, Texas. Quarterback Colt McCoy strikes gold in the early on. McCoy can't find it. Open receiver going to go end zone. Field judge signaling touchdown to Malcolm Williams. Obenaya leads the way, and McCoy scores for the second time. He's not the front runner for the Heisman Trophy. I don't know who it is. It was unbelievable what Colt was doing, shredding defenses that year. He made our job easy. Let's say if it was starting long, normally a defense would get up and get ready. We were still sitting down, relaxing, drinking Gatorade and sunflower seeds uh, because we knew Colt and company was going to get the job done, convert, and keep the chains moving. This night, uh, he couldn't miss. After that ball game, if they had voted for the Heisman, there's no question in my mind Colt would have won the Heisman Trophy. They snap it off to Shipley. The roommates run an end zone. Touchdown, Texas. Can't stop this offense. The roommates, they've got a great instinct for one another. I had people come up to me and say, if we have to hear Brent Musburger one more time say that you and Cole are roommates, we're turning the TV off. That got old real fast, and we pretty much decided at one point if, if, uh, if that didn't stop, we were just going to have to, we we're going to separate and kind of end the roommate deal because it was, it was definitely overblown a little bit. That's going to do it. Any question who the number one team in the country is? No, sir. We got a chance now. We got a chance. This team can be really good. We just got to keep getting better and better and better. We can't slow down. We can't slow down. We got to pull together tighter and we got to keep working. Nobody thinks you can win two more. Nobody thinks you can. That's fun. That's how we do it. Hey, no, oh. yeah. I said, hey, no, oh. yeah. You like OSU? Hell no. Now you've got Des Bryant and Zach Robinson coming in at a high-powered offense from Oklahoma State, and you've got to go back and reset your emotion, start your season over again, and play another team that's in the top ten. I remember thinking, this may be the best team out of all three. And I remember coming into the game thinking, we better be on our game, otherwise it's going to be a rough one. Let's take their heart, man. Let's take their heart and send them home, man. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to win this game, win this game. Oklahoma State was was really good. They had some playmakers and their defense was was very underrated in my opinion, and it was a struggle. Now the fade to the corner, got it, touchdown, Shipley. And there's a run for a touchdown. Kendall Hunter scoots around the end for 23 yards. McCoy to the end zone. Touchdown. Quick slant, touchdown, Oklahoma State, Bo Bowling. Colt McCoy, quarterback draw, touchdown. Robinson, deep. A convoy out there, Texas wins. I remember walking off that field thinking, man, this is a grind. I mean, playing a third straight top 10 team will, will take its toll on you no matter who you are. When uh, I was coaching at Oklahoma, uh, Coach Frank Rolls was calling one of our, our games. He said, you'll only get your team ready to play uh, at its best with full energy about four times a year. So I, I've got this on my mind as we're going through this gauntlet of emotion because uh, it's very, very difficult for guys to play the best they can play at, at the highest level of emotion four straight weeks. This will be fun in love. Now it will be fun. Seven o'clock, national TV game again, and I think Texas won. Best I, best I can tell. So you've got undefeated Texas, undefeated Texas Tech. They'll be in the top five, headed to Lubbock for another national uh, TV shootout. So, hey, if they all say you can't do it four, four times in a row, I'm damn sure banking on you now. Playing Oklahoma State, we felt like we had them, and then we had Texas Tech. And we knew if we took care of those two games that we could beat the rest of the teams on our way to the national championship. Can Texas make history? Can they beat a fourth team in a row that's ranked inside the top 12 but done again once in history? This is Texas' shot at the national title game. So the pressure is squarely on Texas. We didn't often look at the media or look at kind of ESPN, the way they were covering it but you had to talk about it. You know, we beat OU, we beat Missouri, we beat OKC. We felt 
invincible, honestly. We felt like we could not be beat. Um, the way we prepared, the way we played, the way we out hustled, the way we out intensified teams. We felt like after these three previous games against top 10 teams that going to Tech might be the toughest of all of those just because you're on the road and you're playing at a place that uh, traditionally Texas has had a, a, a tough time winning. First of all, you hate Lubbock. You hate the hotels, food's terrible. When Tech was up, they hated us, we hated them. Of all the teams that I played in college, I can't stand Tech. I wanted to beat Tech every time. And I didn't want to just beat them, I wanted to beat them bad. They were literally like a bunch of misfits that we felt like weren't good enough to play at the University of Texas, and that's how they felt. They definitely wanted to ruin our season. All week long, we heard about you know, Tech fans camping out for game day, trying to get tickets, just the most hostile city. Well, saddle up for a landmark day in Lubbock, Texas. Imagine your favorite team racing for the biggest showdown in school history against a hated in-state rival just after sundown. The Red Raider Nation has never been larger, never been louder. The atmosphere was crazy. They had people camping there for the game. Game day's there for the first time. And the fans were gonna make sure their presence was felt. Going into the stadium, we getting burritos, thrown at us, batteries thrown at our buses. They always threw the tortillas at us, but I think they froze a few of them that year. The game is probably an 8 o'clock start, 8.30 start, and you know, so you know, 4.30 or 5 o'clock, we're, we're walking through the, through the stadium, and I, the whole lower section is, is sold out. I mean, they're rowdy, they're painted up, they're, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're throwing stuff at us. I mean, we're in our street clothes walking across the field. It was intense, man. The whole stadium was dressed in black. Just had a whole bad feeling about it. Number one, Texas faces number seven, Texas Tech. The winner stays unbeaten and remains very much in the BCS title game hunt. That place was jam-packed. It was absolutely crazy. That place was as loud as any place I've played in, in college. You're backed up and the students are right behind you. I mean, I mean we, you can't hear yourself think. First play of the game, we get a safety. From that point on, we were battling the noise more than we were ourselves. Loud, folks, real loud. Third and ten. We just weren't in sync. Delay a game, offense. Five yard penalty. Still third down. It was an eerie feeling, almost like a twilight feeling. Nothing we were doing was working, and everything was just a little bit off. Gonna go deep. Got a man open, and simply can't hold on. And it was kind of unexplainable. It was a fast-paced game. They came out with a plan, and they came out on fire. I remember the first couple of series, them moving the ball pretty fluidly on us. Throws deep down the left sideline, trying to run under oh. it. He makes the catch. Oh, wow. Coach Brown said, we're going to have to handle their surge. They're going to come out with absolutely everything. It was more surge than we even thought. Harrell. Hands off the bat, straight up the middle. Touchdown, Red Raiders! Carroll, wide open in the middle is Swindle. Fires, reaching for the first down, and got it. Nothing could go our way defensively. We could not make a play. We couldn't get off the field. Low snap, picks it up. Got that wide open. Touchdown! It just seemed like one bad thing after another. Colt McCoy has nobody to throw the football to. Thrown down. What a defensive performance from the Raiders. Our run game was just getting stuff, stuff, stuff. We couldn't get anything going running the football. In his first half, I see one team that's hungry, that's playing with desire, and another team that looks lost. I'm shocked to see them at this point up 22 to 3. Steps up. Intercepted. Picked off by Charbonnet. And Charbonnet scores! We have not seen Colt McCoy and his Texas offense struggle like this all year. Everything went wrong. Everything imaginable 
went wrong in this game. It was difficult to, to watch. We had a, a bunch of guys dinged up. Ragpo ended up leaving the game. Lamar Houston was out. Jordan Shipley had a, a slight pull. Juan goes out of the game, so you've got half of your best receiving core is, is on the bench. Somebody has to step up and make some plays, and that day it was Malcolm. Malcolm Williams, what a player. Complete. And running to the end zone is Williams. Touchdown, Texas. He was a guy who could make a big play. Got a man open. Malcolm Williams stepped up and had a career night. Got him. And in a foot race is Williams pulling away. They won't catch him. Touchdown, Texas. Colt had a demeanor about him that was just, you know, it's business time. Let's go. Let's get down the field and let's do it. First down and 10 now for Colt McCoy. Trying to engineer still another fourth quarter comeback. I step in the huddle and I look everybody in the eyes and I say, all right, we got to go win the game. I mean, the ball's in our hands. This is our time. This is our opportunity. It's what we're supposed to do. Got the first down. I was constantly telling, you know, if you got the first down, get down and bounds so the clock can keep running. If you're a running back, stay in bound. Don't go out of bounds. We're going to score, but don't stop the clock. That leadership that Colt had took over. He knew he had to make adjustments, stand in that pocket a second longer, or take off running. He orchestrated that offense down there and was as calm as I've ever seen. Two and a half minutes remaining. McCoy keeps it. Got the first and ten. Colt very methodically takes us down the field. He's watching the clock. He's handling things well. End zone, touchdown, 33-32. Wow, what a turnaround here. After we scored, our sidelines are, are fired up. Guys are going crazy. We've just made one of the most epic comebacks uh, on the road against a top five team who's undefeated. But I just took my helmet off. I walked to the sidelines. I sat on the bench. And I just prayed, like, I think I left him too much time. Colt McCoy had his moment. He took advantage of it. Now it's back to number six and Black Graham Harrell to see what he can do. It's a minute and 29 seconds on the clock. We know as a defense we have to go out there and make a stop. Harrell back to throw. Pressure coming. Steps up. He's going to run. I floated with quarterback's eyes a little bit. Made a good break, I felt like, on the thrown ball and when it was batted up in the air. Throws. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. Intercepted. Game over. No, they're calling it incomplete. Ball went up in the air. Looked like it was intercepted. But somehow, the defender did not come down with the football. Oh, man. We, it was like a gift in heaven. Just the dumbest thing ever. I mean, it slipped through my arms, and I knew it as soon as it slipped through, but I don't think it really hit me the magnitude of the situation. When you have a gift like that and we still couldn't make a play, it just wasn't our night. There's eight ticks of the clock left. You know, I remember just watching him throw the ball, and I'm thinking, it's over. You know, we got guys back there that are going to tackle him or maybe even pick the pass. Deep strike, got the big man, Tantay pulls free! No way this just happened, no way. Surely he stepped out of bounds. On the sideline, literally tiptoed his way into the end zone. And touchdown, Red Raiders! We double covered him. We, we had two deep on him. And, and we had Earl Thomas uh, over the top, which is one of the best safeties in the country. And they throw the ball into double coverage. So we think it's the perfect throw for us. We've got the right defense. All of a sudden, Crabtree catches the ball. Our guys kind of stepped away from him. I asked Earl Thomas later, why did you back off? And he actually said he heard a whistle. When he heard the whistle, he thought he couldn't get a penalty because if he hits the guy late, it's 15-yard penalty. In. And then they can come back and kick the field goal and win the game. When I see him running through the goal line and the clock's basically almost at zero, I, I just can't believe it. The next thing I remember is the, the field is covered in people. That's about chaos. Cole poster down on one side of the field. I remember the Texas Tech fans rushing the field, throwing their tortillas. Walking back to the locker room, just crushed. I was crying on the way in. It was tough to, to take in the fact that we just lost. You 
totally committed your mind and your heart to the fact that somehow or another you're going to pull it off. And then the reality sets in of we just actually lost this game. Right after the game ended, that's when the full magnitude of the play before, man, what, the game would have been over if I just would have caught the ball. Blake actually had some very disturbing calls. And some of our fans were, were not good. There's a note here that says you've got some death threats. Yeah, uh, there was something like that. Gideon, I love him to death. He takes a lot of heat for that, for that game. He puts that on his shoulder, but it's really not his fault. We all have played a part into that catastrophe. All those guys let me know whose opinions were important. I never played the game for anybody sitting in the stands. Um, they weren't at summer workouts with us. They weren't running the stadium and, and doing all that stuff that, that Coach Madden had us doing uh, to earn the right to be Texas football players. We made sure that that play was never talked about again. You know, we're on a lot of words spoken in the locker room after that game. We're getting closer to the opportunity to go to the national championship, and all of a sudden, you know, where are we going to be? Eight seconds. Second down now. Deep strike. Got the big man. Can't turn. Pulls free. And touchdown. Texas Tech upsets the number one team in the country. After losing the Tech, it sparked a new fire in us. Before the Tech game, it was strictly confidence. After the Tech game, it was confidence with a huge chip of madness. You get a damn attitude about yourself, because when you play that way, they can't miss a drop. And the Longhorns brought the heat. Griffin under pressure, escapes one tackle, escapes a second, down he goes! Rolling right, with a world of time, throws deep, he's got Cosby, it's caught! Touchdown, Texas, Juan Cosby! This one's going to be about having fun. It's going to be about a lot of energy, and it's going to be about getting after their ass and being Texas. Here we go. Let's go. Yeah. Impressive drive here for Texas. McCoy wants to throw. Nobody around. Now he's going to run a block. Goes to the outside. Touchdown, McCoy. Following back-to-back -back wins, the Longhorns had a bye. That week, the eyes of Texas were focused solely on the matchup between Texas Tech and Oklahoma. Oh, we're watching it now. <laughs> we're watching it. And that was like a gauge for us. We wanted to see how good Texas Tech really was. You got to figure, there's no way Texas Tech beats Oklahoma. My hope was that at least it would be a good game, and it wasn't. It's a stomping in Norman, folks, an old-fashioned stomping. The Sooners roll 65-21 over previously unbeaten Texas Tech. Oklahoma completely destroyed them. Seems like they were so complacent with beating the University of Texas that they completely forgot about playing the Sooners. I looked at the TV. I don't remember where, exactly where I was, but I just turned it off and wanted to throw up. Me, personally, I, I was offended by that. I was mad at Tech. I said, you guys play like you did against us and then go and, and play horribly in, in Norman. And of course, the Oklahoma players knew what was on the line, and uh, Tech just did not show up. That's what's ahead for our one loss team. The interesting thing to me, and the debate that's going to be ongoing, is going to be between Oklahoma and Texas. Oklahoma has the game against Oklahoma State right. in Stillwater. Big stage again Saturday night on ABC. Texas plays on Thursday night against AM. If they both win, the huge debate will be style points and trendy hot team Oklahoma versus Texas beating them head to head. It was funny in 2004, people jumped on me for what they called politicking or whining, and I just said I thought we had a good enough team that we should be in the BCS, so somebody look, and now the BCS modern day has forced coaches into standing up. We beat that team by 44 points, and, and so, and they are a team that just a couple weeks ago beat Texas. Everybody's different. Some people don't care about style points. Somebody will look at our game with Oklahoma and say that was enough. In the end, you do with it as you will. I'm not going to sit here. You know what the arguments are. Everybody can raise them as they want to. But it was funny. I was thinking this morning that the BCS has accomplished what they wanted. They've got everybody talking about it. There's no question that someone will get left out that's a really good football team. And it's a discussion this week. Next week, it's a problem. Going into the last regular season game, there's so much uncertainty in the air. Coach Brown told us, he said, we have to take care of ours first. 
we still had a rival who really, really, really hated us. You don't know if, if you win this game, if that's going to mean that you go to the Big 12 championship and then, you know, on to the national championship, or if you win this game, are you going to be, you know, completely destroyed and disappointed that some computer decided that maybe you weren't the best team? Looks, still looks, now under pressure, he'll tuck it in, and roll, and throw, and caught! Touchdown, Texas! McCoy has done it again! Here's Colt, straight up the middle, 10, 5, touchdown, Texas! Colt McCoy, his second rushing touchdown of the night! When we walked off the field after the A&M game, we felt proud of, of what we had done, what we had accomplished, and in the back of our minds thought, hey, this is enough. We're, we're, the, we're the best team in the country. Surely everybody else can see that. Now, as far as the championship game the BCS, I will do my best to stand up because all I have to do is say what you all did. And, that, and that's it. And if they don't want us, hell with them. The system's bad if they don't want us. I'm going to tell you that. So Texas won by 40, second biggest margin of victory in the history of the rivalry with AM. What does Oklahoma have to do tonight? To me, the trend shows, regardless of what Texas did against Texas A&M on Thursday night, if Oklahoma wins this game, Oklahoma's going to the Big 12 championship. Wow. Game. Texas was the flavor of the week in the middle of the season. They beat Oklahoma, who's number three in the nation. They beat Missouri, number 13. They beat Oklahoma State, hey, a number 11. Three times in a row they won big games. They lost on the last play to Texas Tech, and also they beat A&M by 40. And I don't want to say nothing. But didn't they beat Oklahoma? Didn't the last time these two heavyweights got in the ring, they boom, they knocked Oklahoma out. You're out, out of there. Aren't you the champion? What the hell is going on? I don't care what they do tonight. They're not going to be better than Texas. Texas knocked them out in a ring. They're the heavyweight champion. Fires deflected, complete look out. End zone ahead for Gretchen. 73 yards. And the curtain comes down on another chapter in the Bedlam game. Sam Bradford and Oklahoma now tied for first in the Big 12 South, and it is up to the BCS rankings to decide who will play Missouri. We'll find that out tomorrow. Let the mystery continue. The latest BCS rankings are out, having dealt a mortal blow to Texas's national title hopes, or so it appears. Despite a head-to-head -head victory over Oklahoma on a neutral field, the number two Longhorns will fog the glass, watching as the Sooners, fresh off a 20-point beating of Oklahoma State in Stillwater, passed them when it mattered most. The differential, as you can see, a mere 13 thousandths of a point. It shocked us that they were talking about uh, hundredths of a point uh, because of a rating and, and the, uh, the, the way the system was, the tie-breaking system was very gray. If Oklahoma and Texas were in the ACC or the SEC, then Texas's 10-point win over Oklahoma in October would be sending the Longhorns to the conference championship game on Saturday. I was really, really disappointed. I was disappointed in the Big 12. I was disappointed for our team. Uh, said that publicly um, and got a lot of criticism for it, but I didn't care. Head to head didn't matter. The fact that we had beaten Oklahoma, uh, losing to Tech hurt us more than beating Oklahoma helped us, and that was very confusing to the players. and And I very honestly couldn't explain it to them either. So the team we beat by ten gets to go to the Big 12 championship, and of course should and are gonna win. And that team gets to go to the national championship. Yeah, that's dumb. I mean. You know, for us, I mean, a win is a win, and it doesn't matter if it's the first week of the season or the last. And, and so all these arguments were just irre irrelevant to me. You couldn't convince me that we weren't better than Oklahoma and Missouri. You just couldn't. And I don't think you convinced any of our fans or any of our coaches. Thank goodness we didn't have social media and the things they have now because I don't know that we would have been able to, especially with the emotional team we had. Man, I don't even know if Muschamp would have been able to stop from commenting on social media. When you heard the final BCS results, what went through your mind? I probably can't say it on camera. <laughs> it was one of the more disappointing times for, for me to have to walk in and and, and tell our team that I, I felt like that uh, uh, we'd been let down by the system in the Big 12. And obviously really hurt Colt that he didn't have a chance to, to play another game right before the, uh, the Heisman voters. Y'all want to all do a hook em? What's up Longhorn fans? Up here on top of the Rockefeller Center and uh, 
I'm going to document this trip for everybody. Uh, looking forward to the Heisman, uh, enjoying being here, and uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. Tonight, one of these young men will step out of time and onto the honor roll of the Heisman Trophy, where his place in history will be watched over forever. Going into the 08 Heisman ceremony, I would have loved to, to bring that trophy home to, to the program and to UT. I was just still frustrated that, you know, these two guys are about to play in the national championship. That's where I should be. That's where our team should be. And so I was just kind of balancing all those emotions at the Heisman ceremony. I've been there enough um, with Ricky winning and Vince losing that I had a pretty good feel of how things were working. And when you're going to win the Heisman Trophy, people spend a lot of time around you and your family. And they weren't spending as much time around Colt and I. And the winner of the 2008 Heisman Trophy is Sam Bradford. Would I have liked to win? Of course, everybody would. You know, I remember walking out of the building and, you know, not really wanting to talk to anybody. I just needed to have a few days where I could just let that sink in and see if I can get geared up to, to go play in a bowl game that probably won't be where we want to be. It's hard to be disappointed about being in the Fiesta Bowl and playing Ohio State and, and, you know, for sure having one of the top four teams in the country. But I still think we all felt like we, we should have been in the big show. I thought our team would just bounce back and be excited about going to the Fiesta Bowl. But Al Groh, the head coach at Virginia at that time, their team's not going to a bowl game, but he asked to come out and watch us in bowl practice. He said, uh, I'm going to tell you something I'm concerned about. And I said, what's that, coach? And he said, every game that you play, you have to create an edge. And you guys are still talking about not getting in the championship game. You're not talking about Ohio State. And I think they're practicing that way. So I think you're in trouble. And he was so right. Uh, I mean, it hit me right in the face. Uh, quit whining. It's done. There's nothing you could do about it. You should have beaten Tech. So we, we had a team meeting that night, and I just told them exactly what uh, Coach said about creating an edge. And then we started that edge on Ohio State that day. We're sitting in the dressing room right before the Ohio State game. And I hear screaming and shouting and, and a chair being thrown in the dressing room. I'm sitting in a little dressing room right next to the player's dressing room. And Jeff Madden's sitting next to me. And I said, Jeff, go find out what's going on. Sounds like a fight or something in there. Jeff goes out and he walks back in with a smile on his face. And he said, oh, coach, it was just Roy Miller. He just kind of stood up and threatened to whip anybody in there that didn't play their hearts out. Almost like wrestling, he literally grab those folding chairs and start flinging them in the locker room, just all over the place. Everybody, y'all better wake the hell up. Go, come on, let's go, let's go, come on. Ain't about the playbook, and ain't about nothing else, but the fact that we are working on you. That's what we gonna be. You be the jerk today in your own position. You be that jerk on that field, man. Before every game, I would hype the team up. I give you know, speeches to them and let them know, like, remind them of who we are if they didn't already know. She came up to me right before the game and said, Rack, I know you think you're going to win, but I'm going to get this defensive player of the, uh, of the game award. I guarantee it. So we a little friendly, but nothing crazy. We shook on it because I was pretty excited about my matchup as well. On second and five, prior to throw. Here comes the pass rush, and down goes Pryor. The big senior, Roy Miller. Ohio State was so good. They had Terrell Pryor quarterback as a freshman, and this guy was a freak. And they had Benny Wells at tailback, and he's a monster. He's so big. It was a dog fight, man, throughout the whole game. Longhorns into the red zone for the third time tonight. This is McCoy doing it himself. Touchdown, Texas! There's the fade route. And there's the touchdown! A pair of quarterbacks hooking up on a five-yard touchdown toss. And again, it's Heron. Same corner, touchdown, Buckeyes! And the Buckeyes go back out on top.
job. Ohio State defense was extremely strong and they were confident in it. And they had did the zero blitz right before the half. Completely caught me off guard. I threw it to Brandon and Quan came off the sidelines and said, hey brother, yeah, don't do that again. If there's a zero blitz, I don't care about getting hit. I'm going to make the catch. On third down, come to me. Lo and behold, you know, we get the ball back and we drive down with 26 seconds and that's when they decide to go zero blitz again. I couldn't believe they were doing it and, you know, Kwan and I had talked about it. Well, I looked over to Colt and he had already given me the signal. By the time my eyes hit him, he was giving me a real quick slant signal. So we were on the same page. tried to go up with him. <laughs> and Roy kind of denied me and said, nah, this is my time. It's my honor to present the 38th annual Tostitos Fiesta Bowl game trophy to Mac Brown and the University of Texas Longhorn. What a game. Let's get do it like we No! Let's get do it like the Texas boys! Let's get do it like we No! Let's get do it like we No! What you got to do is spend some time here. This is the last time this group will ever be together. Yes, sir. Last time. So make sure you appropriately go thank your coaches, your staff, and each other. Because this doesn't happen very often, men. This doesn't happen very often. This is as close to a national championship as you can get without being in Miami. And I can promise you, nobody will fight harder than we did all year. And nobody will play better than we did tonight when it counted. So whether they vote us number one or not, we damn sure know that we deserve it. And we are the best team in the country because of your heart. Because of your heart. The 08 players will go down in my mind as some of my favorites because they were trying to live up to that legacy and standard of, of the 04 and 05 team that won two Rose Bowls back to back. And I wasn't real sure in preseason they were ready to do that. And for them to have a chance to play for a national championship, be number one a lot of the year, beat number one Oklahoma, and then beat a, a tremendous Ohio State team in the Fiesta Bowl, to me, they gave us more than I thought they even had in preseason. It wasn't a, a team of the number one, you know, recruiting classes. It was a team of 3A guys, 2A guys, you know, those level guys who really bought in, who came together, who knew what team meant. It was a team of football players. We played with pride, we played with passion, and we played as an underdog. I'm proud of what we did, what we accomplished as a team. I'm proud of the guys that I've dressed out with. We created a family and a feel for the game that year that was almost unmatched. I think about love. There was a lot of love in that team, and that's what made the, the one game we lost against Tech hurt so much. It's hard to pinpoint what the legacy is of that team. On one hand, the potential to be the best team in the country, that opportunity didn't present itself. But the team, the heart, the story behind, all of that is deep. And the love that we had for each other, the desire to embrace the complete epitome of Texas football. You can never take that from us. <laughs> 